Actually, Irfan Ali had intended to go on for three hours. He left his notes here. They're still here. And I see that he didn't even get through halfway of those notes. So comrades, in opposition, we promise two things. We promise that we'll win the 2020 elections, and we did that. And we promise that we will emerge in government as a more diverse political party. And we did that, as you, you see the evidence here today. And let me make it clear that these were not easy tasks. If we did not succeed in 2020, this country would have been a very different place. And secondly, emerging as a diverse political party is not easy to, particularly in a country where there is a systematic, ongoing campaign of racism. So today, you okay? I had to put your paper down in front. So today, I'm not going to speak for very long, because in the next session, that we'll get to immediately after this one, I have to present the report of the Central Committee of our party. And in that report, I will trace the entire history of the party, what our core values are, the founding principles of our party, and our achievements and struggles throughout our entire history. I will deal with the period in opposition and now how we are charting the course to the future. But today, now here at this forum, I want to focus on a few issues because this activity is televised. And many of you here are members of this party. You know what I'm talking about. You know what brings us together. You know what motivates us. You know about our achievements. But there are a large body of people out there who have heard various issues about this party in an attempt by the opposition and other forces to redefine us. And so they may not be as fortunate as you are to understand the true nature of this party and what it means to this country. And I endorse what Gail Teixeira said, that if you trace our history, you will see that we are always stood on the right side of history from the formation of this party. You will see that in 1950, when Chedi Jagan created this party, it was created as a party to fight for independence for all of our people. It was a party that included people from various classes, all of Guyanese, from their different races, from different religion. And we had a goal of freeing our country. And it was largely the PPP struggle that led to that victory, to the country achieving independence. And then in the period when dictatorship stalked these lands, and when many of our people had to leave Guyana to seek their fortunes elsewhere, and when many people were repressed and the economy tanked and 
poverty just was pervasive everywhere. When people lost welfare, they lost their rights, they lost their dignity in this land, they lost hope about our future. It was the PPP that stood like a bulwark fighting again to restore freedom and dignity to this land. And we have, we, were, we inherited in that period a legacy from the APNU. And sometimes it's worth repeating what this legacy was and how we overcame it. Because too often people do not hear this. And there are some young comrades here. There are lots of young comrades here. And we suffered a lot because we do not repeat often enough what we mean to this country and how we have changed it. So what was the legacy in 92? The legacy was one of poverty, hopelessness, non-existent democratic institutions, a politically aligned army, weakened infrastructure, antiquated economic legislation, no investment. We were declared a pariah state. Rigged elections was the method through which you got into office. Social and economic decline was seen as the order of the day. And then mass migration of our people, and of course, a bankrupt economy. And what, what happened? We took a bankrupt economy and returned it to solvency and one of the most dynamic economies in the world, even before oil and gas. We took a pariah state and returned it to global significance and leadership. We took a dictatorship and cemented it, transformed it, not only into a democracy, but rebuilt the democratic institutions that will defend a democratic state. And we took hopelessness and replaced it with hope for a brighter future. These are not easy tasks, and your party did it. And we must constantly remind the others who try to redefine us every single day of what this party stands for and what it means to Guyana. We are now witnessing a new era of transformation. And this transformation has to be led by the PPP. We're equipped to do it based on our history, our experience, and our achievements. And I'm proud to say that we are led by a young leader, Irfan Ali, who came out of this party. I know Irfan Ali well. Irfan Ali is one of the most courageous persons that I've ever met. I, and also, in my tenure, he was one of the most efficient ministers we've had. He could have handled large-scale tasks easily, and you see him bring that skill into government because of his dynamic, energetic leadership now. Many, we had many naysayers when we chose Irfan Ali, and Irfan Ali, thank you for proving all of them wrong. Thank you for proving all of them wrong. A young leader who has many, many more years to lead us and to serve the people of this country. And we're proud of him. But why is this transformation so has to be lead, led by the PPP? Because the key attributes of the transformation, the core values of this party, patriotism, democracy, freedom, they, these are inclusivity. These are key words 
in the People's Progressive Party that we don't toy with. We don't just say them and they mean nothing to us. They pervade our entire being as a political party. When we speak of inclusivity, we don't say it just like that. It gets reflected into our, into our entire policy making. And so today, many people want to drag us into a sterile political debate, ideological debate, and they're stuck in a different era. They want us to debate the isms, capitalism, socialism, Marxism, and really, I say sterile because this party has had one ideology from its beginning, a working class ideology. A working class ideology that is reflected in our constitution. If you read the preamble to the constitution of the People's Progressive Party, it says political pluralism, ideological pluralism, political democracy, cultural di diversity, and racial equality. Now, this was the constitution of the party from its inception. Listen carefully. Ideological pluralism. Political pluralism, cultural diversity, and racial equality. Why do we have to all the time be defensive about what we want? That's, that's our life in this party. That's in the Constitution. So when we say our policies are pro-poor, when we say that the the pervasive, the key focus of the government will be a pro-poor one, it gets re that ref is reflective of our ideology, a working people's ideology. But does that mean that we can't be pro-development or pro-private sector at the same time? The answer is no. It's a false country. It's a false way of placing the question because we, our constitution, mandates us to focus on development. And therefore, as of a necessity, we have to focus on private sector growth and the political pluralism that we talk here. So, so this is, I'm going to put that debate to rest here today, because you will see Every week, articles coming out about what is the PPP doing. And they want us to go back to the terminology of 60 years ago. We don't have to do that to define who we are. We are a working class party. We believe in the development of all Guyanese. We believe in racial equality. We believe in cultural diversity. We want prosperity for all of our people. Secondly, how are we going to deal with the resources of this country? Can you get some water for me, please? If I order the people to take away his drink back. Thank you. So, huh? we believe for those out there, I'm talking, who are not here, who are listening to us. Some of them are sympathetic to us. Many are here in Guyana. Some are in the diaspora. And then you have a whole slew of up new people glued to the television now listening to us too and the detractors. So I'm speaking to them too. What do we believe in? We believe in equality of opportunities. We believe in the equitable distribution of the resources of the state. So President Ali just made that point. 
He spoke about how this gets reflected in our budgets. And in the oil and gas sector, if that's a burning question on your mind, yes, that will happen in the oil and gas industry too. And we will create, and we've started creating, a framework not only to ensure that that happens, but by investing in the things that matter most to poor people, education and health care and better housing and community infrastructure and job creation. 15,000 direct jobs that are funded by the budget. But we are also putting in place a framework that would hold both the investors and the government accountable, ourselves accountable for the, the stewardship of this sector. And because we are a political party with credibility, because we are a political party with experience in policy making, because we have had this history of achievement, we can do so easily and we are uh, doing it. Secondly, we believe as a fundamental part of our value and belief system in gender equality. The women, or particularly of this party and the country, they are sometimes the driving force of this nation, and they would always have the PPP behind their backs, supporting them, working to ensure that their lives are better and that they are not excluded from opportunities in this country. We believe in young people. Young people are the, this is one party that does not have to demonstrate its belief for young people and vesting them with responsibility. We have had, in my tenure, I came into the cabinet when I was in my 20s. Irfan Ali came into the cabinet in his 20s. Many of the ministers there, the 35 years president, the young presidents, etc. Our party, the leadership of this same party, that they speak about us being fossilized and old timeish, etc., they chose these people to run the country. So we have always given. We've always given young people not just lip service in our party. We have trained them, included them, we have vested them with responsibilities, and when necessary, we have elevated them to the highest offices in this land. That is testimony to young people. You can talk all day long about young people. Our, our counterparts in the opposition they believe you could hold a good show and bring in an artist to deal with young people, and that's the end of it, or build a cricket ground or a football stadium, um, football ground, which they didn't do much of in any case. So, on fighting for racial and religious harmony, that's key to this party too, and that is important. I, I think. Chedi Jagan, if he was standing here, would have been the proudest person in this room as I am as General Secretary of the party. In the period throughout our history, we fought for racial unity in this country. Even in the worst period, after the externally instigated riots, by particularly by the Americans and the British in the Cold War era. Chetty Jagan, if you listen to his speeches, he never gave up on racial unity. He saw it as a historic mission of the People's Progressive Party. And why did people stay away from us? They stayed away from us because the PNC has been very clever. They have used a combination of lies, falsehoods, to keep people away from us by redefining what this party is. And that's why today, 
We are going to robustly challenge that notion. We are defining this party as to what it is now, today. We are, we are ensuring that all these lies are answered on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. Sometimes they think we're thin-skinned or we're too pervasive. They say that we're too incessant, that you ease off a bit. Why you have to be fighting all the time? Well, we will fight for racial unity because we believe in it. And the reason they don't want us to fight this way is because they want to keep people being fed with their lies. I'm so proud that we have grown this party. We always had indo um supporting the PPP. However, we have grown this party in a major way. Nearly one-third of our delegates are from the hinterland at this conference. We have grown our party in uh, Guyanese of mixed descent, and it's growing in the Afro-Guyanese communities, and I'm so proud of that. Chedi Jagan always wanted this, because he knows that this party would be invincible if we reflect the, near, the full gamut of the country. And he fought for that, and it's happening today. And so we'll continue to fight for it. We will fight to expand rights of people. We did it many times before. We passed under the PPP, one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. It was akin to power sharing at the, the judicial level, not the judicial, the, the legislative level. If you go through the features of that constitution, many people don't even read it. They criticize it. They want it change. But they never really explore the, depth, explore the depth of the constitutional measures that we put in place to promote inclusivity and the rights of different groups of people in this country, and also building into the constitution the mechanism for the enforcement of those rights. If you examine it, and this should be a program, a, pro, a, a project for everyone, you will see what, has, what happened. But we're back at it again. When those who were contesting the last elections argued for constitutional changes, we said, you're too arrogant because the small parties want to change one provision or another. We said, we have to go back to the people. It is a people's document. And we're, we're just in an enlightened fashion. We have just appointed a constitutional reform body that took five from government and five from opposition and 10 from civil society to do that once again, once again, because we believe it's a living document, but ultimately it must withstand the test of the people because it's their document. It replaced the 1980 Burnham dictatorial constitution. That was one of the key changes we made. So we believe in enshrining rights, not just in the body of legislation that we have passed for women's rights, reproductive rights, all rights, children's rights. All of these are in the legislation, but we have enshrined a lot of those rights in the Constitution for indigenous people, the Indigenous Peoples Commission in the Constitution. We believe in an impartial judiciary. And sometimes this belief is tested. It's tested. And, but we believe in the separations of power. We believe that we still need to hold, regardless of, of which branch of the government in which you serve, whether it's the executive, the legislative branch, or the judicial branch, branch of the government, that you have to be accountable to, to people. And therefore, we have to ensure that that happens in the future. We have to raise the quality of decision making. And let me say to you that had we not taken 
the decision in the early 2000s to go back to the CCJ or to join the CCJ, Burnham came out of the access to the Privy Council, remove us from the access to the Privy Council because he did not want an external review should there be rigged elections in Guyana. We return to that. If we did not take that decision in the early 2000s and join the CCJ, this party would not have been in power today because the local courts ruled basically that Lowenfield had the right to disenfranchise 175,000 persons based on this alien to our constitution and to our laws concept of valid votes. Totally alien. A flawed decision that was thrown out by the CCJ without, I don't think they even had to study it to throw it out. So we believe in that. We believe in a free press. We have always promoted free press. We believe that when we were the subject of assault, when the PNC banned newsprint, when people had to smuggle newsprint in the country, when the state had access monopoly over every means of communication, we fought through that era, the Chedi Jagan era. And therefore, it's deeply ingrained in us. We believe in the plurality of opinions and debate. And that's why we believe in a free press. We believe in NGOs working and we support NGOs. We support them because many perform a useful task. But when, but when they serve as a means of division, when they believe that an unelected few can arrogate to themselves the powers to believe that their voice must be the monopoly voice and their approbation the only thing that matter in a democracy, then we will fight that to our very core because we're a political party that will never, never ever allow that to happen. Those ideas are not consistent with a free society and we want to be, build a free Guyana where our children can grow, flourish, and, and develop their lives here in a condition that of freedom and plurality. And that is why we're not thin-skinned. We just have a record. And when they distort this record, the Kaicho News or some of these unaccountable NGOs, every day they're at it. And you know what? They were at it in the past. In 2015, they they even influenced some of our own people to believe the lies that they told about us. And that is why it is you here, the members of this party, you have a duty, every single one of you, to learn of our history and achievements. You have to learn of our struggles so that each one of you can stand up and defend what we mean to this country because history will be rewritten. The villains are now the heroes of our history in these stories of fiction that every single day you see concocted by NGOs and by newspapers. That is true, important to us. We believe we must eliminate differences in our people, equality of opportunities to education and jobs for all of our people and prepare them for the, the future. That is why the focus on the hinterland, ensuring there is no coastal hinterland divide. Indigenous people have suffered enormously in the past. Chedi Jagan made this a priority by declaring a month-long celebration for indigenous people, a time when they were treated as second-class citizens in this country. We, we passed the new constitution, the Indigenous Peoples Commission, 
Amerindian land, land rights, the act, Amerindian act, uh, act, and in which we enshrine a whole bundle of rights, but we have also invested heavily in the social development of hinterland communities and economic opportunities for hinterland people and expanding access to health care and edu education that are non-existent. So you think it's by chance that we're the biggest party in the Amerindian community? It's by hard work that the PPP did in the years. It's not by chance. They got a shock in opposition. They thought they have this old conception that whoever goes last to an Amerindian village will get the votes. Well, we didn't go last in any place. And after the elections were over, two APNU men said, oh, look, we built a bridge in region, region one in Maruka. And how come they didn't vote for us? But they didn't say that every year they collected nearly $2 billion of taxes from region one. The, when we had declared the area virtually tax-free. They put customs there, pushing the hardship. They didn't talk about the assault on indigenous people by taking away 700 million per year um, from their villages. They didn't talk about the calling them um, greedy, all of these things. So we, the workers of this country, indigenous people of this country, all races, now can get the support of the PPP, not because it's special treatment, but because our mission is equality of opportunities, equality for everyone. We are, people ask us, what about power sharing? What about power sharing? Will the PPP want to share power with the political parties? Notice, every time APNU is out of office, they call for power sharing. When they're in office, they say, forget this, you know, we're the majority, is ma majority, this is our time. So, we have to work together with all political parties. But there are some critical things when you talk about working together that the same people who write incessantly about power sharing miss. Trustworthiness is a big part of that. APNU supporters don't even trust APNU because they failed to implement the manifesto promises. They can't even get trust from their own supporters because they failed them, they made all these promises. The Cummingsburg Accord promised to the AFC chairing of cabinet naming ministers. The ink had not dried on the Cummingsburg Accord, and their partner in crime, the AFC, was kicked out basically, was reduced to a rubber stamp, which they gladly accepted. They, were, they did not fulfill a single promise of a written accord. How could you trust a party of that nature? How can you trust a political party that refuses to admit that the 2020 elections was rigged or they attempted to rig it and still claim they have the SOPs in a little box that can show their win? Really? And then how can you tr trust a party that will want to use rigging of elections as a tool to come to power. We are Democrats. We believe in democracy. We believe in freedom for people to choose their own government freely, openly, and that you must work for their support, which is what this party does. We work for people's support. We don't bully them. We don't threaten them. We don't harass them. We don't boycott them. Yes. And then, the C Irfan is heckling now about the CPU disappearing too. So, and then the next point about the, how can you support a party that believes its only mobilizing tool is racism? 
racism, nothing else. Everything. They, if the rain fell today, that's a racist thing. You know something? They, you saw this convention center. Oh, we're taking over this body. I noticed they didn't. They didn't. Um, they, they, they didn't build this place too. You know, they said they criticized me for building it. Yeah, they said, oh, why are you spending this money? Another said saying, oh, we're holding a rival day. The party disrespects, disrespects Indian because we're holding a rival day. Our Congress tomorrow is a rival day. And I want to wish everyone a happy rival day. But we're disrespecting. Who you think made that a holiday? We too in the PBP, we did that. And so, and then the other side said, oh, they're racist. You see, they hold it on a rival day only, right? This is what they're wallowing. So how could we engage in any meaningful dialogue like what Shetty Jagan always wanted, some form of engagement? He promoted this concept, a national front government to confront promises or the challenges of the future. But you have to have willing partners, and there must be some attributes to those partners. Trustworthiness is a key one. We, in the international scene, our party has always had a principal position. And that principal position got reflected in a new global human order of Chedi Jagan. We always supported and give solidarity to people who are struggling against oppression elsewhere. So we're not conflicted when we talk about the Palestinian people and their support for a, a state of their own. It's a just cause. And we have given leadership, global leadership, Irfan Ali again, traversing the world. We are now among the cutting edge. Our opinions are sought on things like climate issues and food security and energy security. These are the crises of the modern day era, global crises. They pose existential threat, not to Guyana, but to the world. And this small country is giving intellectual and moral leadership to the world on these matters. This is the party that you belong to. That's why you must be proud as I am. You must be proud in these achievements. So we have to continue working. I'm going to have to save because I still have to present another report. And I think it's gone long since your front took up most of the time. <laughs> yes, so I'm going to cut short here. So. <clears throat> What is it? We are not fighting for political force. We have to win the 2025 elections and win them massively. We are not fighting for political power in this country because it's an ego trip or a pathway to privileges and parks like the other party did. We are fighting for political power because we have a historic mission that we have to complete, started off from the beginning of our party. We need to bring all of these people, everybody, all of our people, together in racial and religious harmony, cement our country going forward. We have that unfinished business, and we have to work at it every day. We have to work to manage in a way that is sustainable, our resources. And again, we're not a wishy-washy party. We've given clear economic leadership of the country from the creation of the, the National Development Strategy, traced its evolution all the way to the Low Carbon Development Strategy. It's a clear process of defining our vision. That's what differentiates us. We have defined our division, our end goal. We have put in place the programs and policies to achieve the end goal. Then other parties don't have a vision. They don't have a plans and programs. They don't have an end goal. 
So that's why this party has to win if we want to ensure prosperity continues. We have a mission to make sure that you have the most efficient people running. We will count on your support, and I know I see the enthusiasm among our people. I want to thank our activists wherever they are, working hard. Now, I'll talk more bluntly to our activists at the next session, the first session of the Congress, but here I want to acknowledge what they did, and our leaders in the Central Committee, the outgoing Central Committee, our cabinet colleagues, many others from NGOs, from civil society, small political parties, the diaspora, everyone who has made a contribution in the past and, and now are continuing to make a contribution to ensure that this party becomes a party well, basically, fulfills its mandate. So, once again, I'll end with this. We, I have great faith in the leadership of your finale. I have great faith in his leadership. And we're together, all of us working together, we will achieve this. Thank you very much.